So happy to be able to be with you another uh, evening like this. The close this Lord's Day winds, uh, continues to wind down to his close, to be able to have a afforded to us this opportunity to study again from God's holy word. I'm going to conclude a series on answering the Sabbatarian arguments, Seventh-day Adventist arguments. We'll be concluding that this evening. And uh, again, want to thank John for uh, leading us in these songs, The Law of the Lord. We're going to be talking about a superficial distinction later on that Seventh-day Adventists make regarding the law of God versus the so-called ceremonial law. As we've been studying this, the very first lesson uh, was, in fact, is, you know, is the Sabbath command a universal command? And we uh, went through the scriptures and saw, you know, based on Genesis, uh, when the Sabbath was given, that it was not a universal command in the sense that it was given for every nation or every people under heaven. When you teach that and you say that, there are some uh, rebuttals that come from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We looked at uh, four of those so far. One with, was that God commanded man to remember the Sabbath day. They'll say the only commandment in the Bible that God tells us to remember is the one that we forget. We don't do. We don't keep the Sabbath day. And we answered that. We showed contextually who was to remember that. We also looked at a second argument that God charged men to keep the Sabbath forever. And so it's supposed to be done forever. We saw that the people that were charged to keep the Sabbath forever, they were to keep it perpetually as they existed as a nation. That was the nation of Israel. It was a sign between God and one nation, Israel. We also spent time answering the question or the argument that the Sabbath command is permanent. It's written in stone. Exodus 31, verse 18. We showed from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that that which was written in stone is a ministration of death and that its glory passed away. There is no other ministry written on stone than the Ten Commandment Covenant, and it is called a ministry of death, and its passing, it was, its glory had passed away. We also looked at the fourth argument that the Sabbath was made for man. And... Uh, from Mark chapter 2, verse 27. That was the last study that we had. And we again inserted the understanding of context. What man is Jesus speaking about here? All men in general? And we looked at who he was talking to. We gave parallel arguments uh, to this, uh, uh, this teaching here in, in Mark chapter 2, uh, verse 27, and answered it uh, fully. Well, tonight that there is a so-called distinction that exists between the law of Moses and the law of God. And then we'll add another argument tonight as well. And Sabbatarians make the superficial distinction that the Ten Commandments is the general, or I should say, uh, is the permanent moral law of God. So the permanent moral law written engraved in stones, that remains forever. But then there is the ceremonial qualities of the law, and that's what was done away with. And the reason they make that distinction is because uh, in the text of the New Testament, we read passages like Colossians chapter 2 that was read this morning by uh, Kyle, where we read that the, in verse 14, chapter 2, verse 14, that the handwriting of requirements that was against us is contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And as you keep going down, he disarmed the principalities in verse 15 and verse 16, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. And so Seventh-day Adventists will say, these are the feasts that no one should judge you in, not the actual days. And so while it says Sabbaths here, they contend that's in the plural, and it is. That means nothing, though, whether it's in the plural or singular. That doesn't take away the, the point that is made here. Uh, it, it, that is that the uh, they, they would say that that's the feast or the sacrifices that were associated, I should say, with the Sabbath day. Well, you're inserting your belief into that, but that's not necessarily the case. He is talking here about the food or drink, the daily offerings, the festivals, the yearly offerings, the new moon, the monthly offerings, and the Sabbath day, the sab seventh day offerings. But all that goes in, and is connected with those days was done away. So let no one judge you in these things, is what he's telling them. God has taken it, and he has abolished it. 
He has, he has taken it away. Um, he has wiped it out, verse 14. Well, they want to make that just the sacrifices, and so they create this superficial distinction. As we have shown that the book of Nehemiah is not a friend to Seventh-day Adventism, and so it is true here again. In Nehemiah, really beginning at the very end of chapter 7, in chapter 7, uh, kind of the middle of verse 73, we read, When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. And it's important to think about the seventh month because there were a lot of religious activities going on in the seventh month. And that, that is prefacing us for what's going on in chapter 8. Well, in chapter 8, verse 1, we read, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Seventh-day Adventism teaches that the law of Moses was done away, but the law of God, i.e. the Ten Commandments, that remains. So we read here, the law of Moses is taken and, and Ezra is reading from that. In verse 2, we read that Ezra the priest brought the law. So it's called the law of Moses, verse 1. It's called the law, verse 2. And he takes it and he's standing on a platform of wood there in verse 4. He reads from it. We come down to verse 8. And they read distinctly from the book in the law of God. And they gave a sense and helped them to understand the reading. If Nehemiah was a Seventh-day Adventist, he wouldn't have worded it that way. He here in verse 8 refers to it as reading distinctly from the book in the law of God. In the law of what God and who God. Yet he's reading from the book of the law of Moses. Law of Moses equates law of God and vice versa. They're the same law. They're not different. They're the same. What he's reading from in verse 1 is what he's reading from, in, what he's taking in verse 1 is what he's reading from in verse 8, or what they're reading from in verse 8. So it's, <clears throat> if there is a superficial distinction between law of Moses and law of God, Nehemiah doesn't know that distinction exists. You keep going on down, and what do we read happening in chapter 8, verse 14? What did they read in the book of the law of God? They read about the Feast of Booths, right? In verse 14, they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. That's why we're prefacing or being prefaced the seventh month. So what's being taught here is we need to keep the Feast of Booths, right? Tabernacles. And they expound on it, teach them what they are to do. And we read in verse 18, here in verse 18, also day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast. They kept the feast seven days. The feast is a part of the law of God. Tabernacles is a part of the law of God. Yes, Moses wrote it. Yes, it's the law of Moses. It's also the law of God here. And they kept it seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly, according to the prescribed manner. So we have bookends here in the chapter 8, beginning with the one bookend, the book of the law of Moses, and then ending here in verse 18, the book of the law of God. Again, if a, super, if a distinction, a hard distinction exists between law of Moses and law of God, Nehemiah didn't know about it. Again, Nehemiah is an Achilles heel to Seventh-day Adventism. They teach that the seventh day was made known from the creation and given to all men since. Nehemiah says, no, that's not the case. In chapter 9 of Nehemiah, as we've read and studied before, in verse 13, you came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances, true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. When was this law made known? When were these commandments made known? When were they given? On Mount Sinai. This is exactly what Moses affirms in Deuteronomy chapter 5, in verse 2 and 3. This covenant was not given to our fathers, but to us, those of us who are alive here today. It wasn't made before this generation in Deuteronomy chapter 5. 
So it's an Achilles heel, the book of Nehemiah is. And remember that. You talk with the Seventh-day Adventists, take them to Nehemiah chapter 8 and Nehemiah chapter 9. Just remember those two chapters. Deal with it. Make them deal with it right then and there. But it's not just the Old Testament that doesn't recognize this distinction between law of Moses and law of God. It's the New Testament. Jesus himself. In Mark chapter 7, verse 10, who said, honor your father and your mother? Who said that? Jesus said, Moses said that. Moses said, honor your father and your mother. Well, did Moses really literally say that? Jesus said, Moses said it. But who is Moses speaking for? God. Because what did God say? Honor your father and mother. And what did God do? He wrote it on tablets of stone. But Jesus says, Moses said it. Now, if he were a Seventh-day Adventist, this clearly would have been said, God had said. So God, you know, the New Testament uses these, the law of Moses, the commandments of God. Uh, what did Moses command? They use those things interchangeably because Moses was the law giver. Even in this Mark chapter 8, what were they laying aside? What does Jesus charge the people for laying aside in Mark chapter 7, verse 8? Laying aside the commandment of God, right? You're laying aside God's commandment. And then he says, for Moses said, honor your father and your mother. Where is honor your father and your mother? That's the fifth commandment, right? In the Decalogue, honor your father and your mother. That is found there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. But Moses didn't just say that, the Ten Commandments. Moses also said something that's in the very next chapter, in our, as it's broken down in our reading. Outside of the Ten Commandments, he said something in Exodus chapter 21. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 17. where we read, he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So Moses said, honor your father and mother. That's Exodus 12, verse 12. That's Deuteronomy 5, verse 16. Moses also said, notice the conjunction here, and, and he who curses father or mother shall be put to death. That's Exodus 21, verse 70. That's not the Ten Commandments. We have Jesus saying, Moses said what was in the Ten Commandments, and Moses said what's outside of the Ten Commandments. See that? There's no distinction between the two. Whether it's Moses saying it or God saying it, there's no distinction between the law of Moses and the law of God. There is no distinction between ceremonial law and moral law. It's all just the law of God. And we need to see that from Holy Scripture. Well, it's not just here. It's in Luke chapter 2. Luke if there was a, you know, a superficial distinction between ceremonial law and the law of God, Luke didn't know anything about it. In the second chapter of Luke, when Mary was after Jesus' birth, we read in chapter 2 about her purification in verse 22, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed. They say, yeah, that's ceremonial law. When they were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. But then in the very next breath, what does Luke say? In the very next pen stroke, verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Well, wait a minute. Is it the law of the Lord or is it the law of Moses? See, there's not two different laws. They're the same law. It's written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. That's the first thing. You are to present the child because it says in the law of the Lord, which Moses wrote, that every male who opens the womb shall be holy to the Lord. That's the first thing. And the second thing, verse 24, is to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. Not the law of Moses. He calls it the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. No distinction. It's superficial. Leviticus chapter 12, verse 8, is the law of the Lord for an Israelite, okay? for a Jew. Just like Exodus 20 is the law of the Lord for an Israelite. God's the one that said, 
The Sabbath is a sign between me and the children of Israel. I didn't say that. I didn't have that written down. That's what Moses said. He's speaking forth the law of the Lord. No superficial distinction. Well, there's another argument. And that is the Sabbath will exist in heaven. And these are some of the comments that we also got on our YouTube page. I mean, one, one sermon had 318 different reactions or views or something like that. A whole bunch of different comments were made. But, you know, the Sabbath, they say, is going to be observed in heaven. I really want you to think about that. They say Isaiah teaches that it's going to be observed in heaven. It's going to exist in heaven. Well, let's go to Isaiah chapter 66. And in Isaiah 66, we read in verse 22 of the new heavens and new earth. Let me just drive down a little peg. Remember, if you know Bobby Holmes, any of you remember Bobby Holmes? He's always had a little peg to drive down. Let me just drive down a little peg. Just because you read an expression in one context does not mean that same expression means the same in another context, okay? When we talk about laying on of hands, laying on hands can be a violent act. <laughs> it can be uh, to impart the Holy Spirit in the Bible. It can be not imparting the Holy Spirit, but setting someone apart for a specific work, right? It can be ordaining a person in, into an, an eldership, okay? So you can have different contexts, same expression, different contexts, right? That's the way it is with the new heavens and new earth. This Isaiah chapter 66 is not talking about the heaven in 2 Peter chapter 3. It's not talking about the earth in 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at this. For as the new heavens and new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Now, I just want you to think about what we just read. You can superficially grab a text and readily misapply it to whatever preconception that you have. Isaiah is not talking about heaven. Isaiah 66, verse 22. What proves too much proves nothing at all. So when you look at verse 23, if we are to say, okay, this is heaven, the heaven that we're all looking forward to being in, the new earth in which righteousness dwells. I ended this morning's sermon with that. If this is that, what's there? You say this, the Sabbath is there, right? Well, what parallels the Sabbath in verse 23? From one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another. Whatever is true of the Sabbath here is true of the new moon. You can't say, you can't divorce the new moon and say, we don't want that in heaven. But we want the seventh day. In, no, if you have the seventh day in heaven, you have the new moon in heaven. Okay? But what else do you have in heaven? Well, you have all flesh. Verse 23. Now we have flesh in heaven. All flesh will, is coming to worship God in heaven. Isn't that amazing? I thought flesh and blood couldn't enter into heaven. But we have all flesh here entering into heaven. What else do we have? We have the ability in heaven to go look upon corpses. Notice verse 24. They shall go forth and look upon corpses of men who have transgressed against me. Is that going on in heaven? We're going to go look on the corpses of men that have transgressed? And not only that, we're actually having a portal into hell because we can see the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Is that what we're doing in heaven? And not only that, when we go above the text, who else do we have in heaven? Verse 21, I will take some of the priests and Levites. Now we have priests and Levites in heaven. What proves too much proves nothing at all. And as soon as you bring the Sabbath day into heaven, you've got to bring all these other things into heaven too. You can't cafeteria style. And I know smorgasbords, right? I like going to the meat. And then I like going to the dessert. But there's also the fruit and the vegetables that are there in God's word that you've got to take it all or take none of it at all. You can't accept some and say, I don't want the rest. And so what Isaiah is speaking of here is 
quite frankly, a new order. It's a new order. The new heavens and new earth is speaking of a new order. Here, it is actually most likely being applied to when they return out of Babylonian captivity and come back into the promised land under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. Possibly, it could be extended into the church, okay? But it's not talking about when Jesus comes a second time and we're all going to heaven. That's not what Isaiah 66 is talking about. And I need to see that, and I need to rightly divide the Word of God, and I need not let my opinion taint what is clearly taught in Scripture. And so let's move forward with this just a little bit. Revelation chapter 21. And I've got 23 on the screen, but look at 22. Revelation 21, 22. I saw no temple in it. There's no temple like what exists on earth in heaven. But the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, right? The temple kind of foreshadowed God walking with man, God dwelling with man. Now we have God with man here in Revelation 21. There's no need for a temple, okay? He is the temple. And then notice verse 23, the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The lamb is its light. If you have no need for the sun, why would you have a sun? Why would you have the sun? If you have no need for the moon, why would you have a moon? You wouldn't. So if you don't have the sun and the moon, how can you have a Sabbath day? Solar day, seven solar days, right? Or 30-day moon, monthly cycles. You can't have that. It doesn't exist there. These things don't exist there. What proves too much? Proves nothing at all. You know, God made the heavens <clears throat> on day two of creation. You know that? Right? We understand that. We see that. The very basic doctrine taught in Genesis chapter one. Here in Genesis chapter one, we, we read that <clears throat> in verse six that he, he said, uh, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters. We have two bodies of water now that are divided between a, with a firmament, an expanse, water here, water here. You might even visualize it, water here and water here. <laughs> expanse in the middle. And then he says, thus God made a firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament. Now we have it vertically. There's waters under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament, and, the, and it was so. Firmament in the middle, water here, water here. And then we read in verse 8, and God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. You know what God does not say here? God does not say, and it was good. God does not say it was good. You know, all the other days, he pronounces a quality assessment. And this was good, and this was good, and this was good. But here on day two, it's not good. Well, what do we read in, in, in going on? Uh, this, this firmament that he calls heaven is going to be filled with lights in verse 14. On day four, let, the light, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons, for days and for years. There's your seventh days your seven-day weeks, right? There's your 365-day year. There's your 30-day month, right? Whatever it is. You got all of that there. You got your seasons, your night, your day. The day itself is divided in two between day and, day and light. In verse 15, <clears throat> so let them be for lights in the firmament. And what? The firmament, what we just read, of the heavens, and give light to the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night. He also made the stars. He made the stars also. God set them where? He set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. Well, what happens here? The heavens and the earth will one day pass away. We know that. Second Peter, even Revelation 21, verse 1 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth passed away, right? Peter tells us, 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 10, 
the demise of the universe, the destruction of the universe. He said, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 2 Peter 3.10, which the heavens in which, in which, there's an in which, right? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The earth and everything done in it is gone. Now, let me tell you this. If the heavens and the earth pass away and the heavens have the stars and the sun and the moon to reflect light upon the earth, why would we think there'd be a Sabbath in heaven when the heavens that contain the solar system and all the stars in our galaxy and beyond, everything beyond, that passes away. Why would we think there's going to be Sabbaths, seventh day, Sabbaths and months there? It just doesn't fit. These things no longer exist for there to be seasons or years. Time as we know it doesn't exist like we know it today. Okay. So one of my contentions is focusing so much on the seventh day, Adventists have forgotten the first. And I'll mention that again if I can remember. But what we have considered in this series is prevalent arguments that Seventh-day Adventists make. These are not all the arguments by any stretch of the imagination. These are some of the major ones. We could go on for another seven or eight lessons and talk about the arguments that are made to favor the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Sabbatarian concept being given to the church. It's not given to the church. It's not given to a Gentile. It's not given to any nation other than one, Israel. But they'll make contentions that it is. And we need to see the difference and know that it's not, not to look down on them, but to show them from the scriptures that that view was made by man and that it's erroneous and you need to get out of that doctrine, get out of that church that teaches that doctrine so that you can be saved. Because as long as you're in that, you are under bondage. And this leads us to the scripture reading that Jess led us in. I know it was a little longer than normal, but... Um, I know Jess has his voice back, so he could, he could do it. Um, in Galatians there, we see here in chapter 4, verse 22, it is written that Abraham had how many sons? He's focusing on two, right? Two sons. The one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who is of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. What son is that? That's Ishmael, right? Ishmael was born according to the flesh. That was not according to God's word. That was man trying to solve God's problems. And then we have in contrast to he who was born of the bondwoman, he who was born according to the flesh was he of the free woman and he of the free woman through promise. God promised Sarah at the time of life next year, you will have a son. Remember, she was like, really? I don't know that that's going to happen and kind of laughing at it. He said, yes, you will. Isaac was a son through promise. What is a promise? A promise are words. So Isaac was a son through the word of God. God gave her a son. She was barren, not able to have children, kind of foreshadowing the virgin birth. God, from the deadness of Sarah's womb, created life there for her and Abraham. He is the child of promise. Paul says, which things are symbolic or an allegorical, for these are two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Hagar gives birth to Ishmael, but Hagar is under bondage. She's not the free woman. Okay? And she, according to Paul, through inspiration here, says she represents Mount Sinai. Well, what was given on Mount Sinai? What did we just read from Nehemiah 9, verse 13? And 14, you made known your laws and you gave your, you made known your holy Sabbath on Mount Sinai, right? What does Mount Sinai represent here? Bondage. As soon as you put people into the Ten Commandment covenant, and please don't misunderstand me, we're not teaching that you can murder or that you can commit idolatry or adultery or steal today. Those things are forbidden in the new covenant. In Jesus Christ, clearly and explicitly taught not to engage in those things. We are to honor our parents in the new covenant. 
But the Ten Commandments kind of serves as a spine for the entire law of Moses. And if you're under that, you're under everything that Moses commanded. And that is called bondage. It's a yoke of bondage. Paul then says this Hagar is about Sinai and Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is. What does he mean by Jerusalem, which now is? It's the present Jerusalem that existed then as he's writing this book and is in bondage with her children. How does he look at the Jews as being in bondage with their children? But the Jerusalem above is free. That's Sarah and her child, Isaac, through promise, which is the mother of us all. We are like Isaac spiritually because it is through the promise or through the word of God that we are born again. And we're born into him, right? When we take up the word of promise and we trust and obey it, we become, like Isaac, children of promise. And Paul, as he's unraveling this in chapter 4, he also explains the persecution that was existing then. Remember what Ishmael was doing to Isaac? He was mocking him. And that's what led to Sarah saying, cast out the bondwoman that Paul is quoting from here. Cast out the bondwoman and the son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. The Jew of the flesh is not going to be an heir with the spiritual Israel, right? With Isaac. And he talks then about uh, how that, how Ishmael was persecuting Isaac. And that explains why the Israelites, the Jews, were persecuting Christians as well. The correlation is there and the correlation is real. So as I said, in focusing so much on the seventh day, sadly, our Adventist friends forget about the first day. Now, a part of my defense or apology, if you will, for the first day of the week is to be in the negative to answer all of their arguments, right? you got to answer what they're saying. you got to show that this is fallacious. But at the same time, you can go in the affirmative and you can teach the evidence why it's the first day of the week that we, we commemorate as the Lord's Day. And I talked a little bit about that recently in a lesson. Maybe in the future we'll hit more. But, you know, I'd like you to appreciate what the Apostle Paul says here. And uh, this is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 5 and verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5 and 6, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, uh, your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. When did God command light to shine out of darkness? When did he do that? The days of creation. Wasn't the seventh? Wasn't the fourth? Wasn't the third? Wasn't the second? It was the first who has shown in our hearts the God who on the first day of creation commanded light to come out of darkness, shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our dark hearts the light, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the resurrection? Yes. Do you believe the resurrection? I taught about that recently, right, last week? When did Jesus rise from the dead? on the first day of the week. When does the light dawn in our heart? What is it about Jesus that makes the light come into our own hearts? It's the fact that he rose from the dead. After he was brutally put to death, he rose from the dead. This is what ratifies his covenant. This is what builds our hope and our trust. But to focus on day seven and the rest in Mount Sinai, That is to keep people in bondage, as Galatians chapter 4, 24 teaches. Why would people do that? Why would people want others to stay in bondage? The invitation, of course, is to come out of bondage and to follow Jesus. He is the one who has given us the plan of salvation. God in Matthew 17, verse 5, does not say, Hear Moses, 
Yes, Moses talked about Jesus, but he tells us to hear my beloved son, hear him. We are to believe Jesus. John chapter 8, verse 24, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. We must repent toward him. We're changing from walking in the course of the world to now we're going to walk towards the Lord. Confessing him as Lord, he who confesses me before men, him I will confess before my Father in heaven, Matthew 10, 32. With the mouth, confession is made into salvation, Romans 10. We must be immersed into his death. Why be immersed in his death? Because he resurrected on the first day of the week, right? That's why we're baptized, because he resurrected. We're baptized into his death so that we can rise up to walk in newness of life and then live faithfully unto him. If you're not a member of the church, we would encourage you to become one. And maybe you have uh, done that and you've uh, kind of got lured back away into the, the world. You've got to be willing to take accountability for your life's actions. And there's a pathway back for you as well where the blood of Christ has been paid for your sins. If you confess your sins to him, he will forgive you of those sins. If you have brought reproach against him, you need to repent of that and pray to God for forgiveness. We can pray for you now at this time. You can know that God will receive you back. This is 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If you're subject to the invitation, please come and let's sing the song John has selected this evening.